Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Another episode of Tales from the Kentucky Room. Our special guest for this podcast is longtime WLEX TV sports broadcaster, director, reporter, pretty much did everything, Alan Cutler. Alan retired from WLEX in 2018 after almost 35 years at the station. He has recently written a book along with John yep. about his time in Lexington reporting on sports, most notably UK sports. The book title is Cut to the Chase. Welcome, Alan Cutler. Good morning. How are you, sir? Pretty good. You, you know, when you said history, you made me feel really old. I was a history major in college. When you're talking about Kentucky history, I said, oh my gosh, am I 93 years old? But- no, we talk about all kinds of Lexington history. And c- can you talk a little bit about yourself, your history, where you were born and raised, how you fell in love with sports? and how you got into the sports broadcasting profession. Well, that's in the book. So the book starts when I was little. And if you get the book, it's called Cut to the Chase. I suggest that you don't start with page one. It's kind of interesting. The table of contents, the chapter names are just goofy. And I love it. And I'd like to tell you we did it on purpose, but we didn't. It happened by accident. I basically ad lib the book on my kitchen table and then the work started. I had lived 460 pages. And so when we would do a chapter, Dr. John Long, who I call Doc, he would say, okay, I'm going to name it something goofy. So he's a genius behind all this. I only named a couple of them. He did most of them. And then when we were done after what seemed like 8,000 years, he said, okay, we have to rename the chapters. And I screamed, no, 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 you're a genius. You don't even know it. And so we left it the way it is. You know, two people at the station I was very close to, the late Brian Collins and Mike Barry. Well, Brian Collins' nickname was Fat Man, so the chapter is named Fat Man and Mike Barry. And it talks about their alcohol problems and how Mike has come back from that. So when you say early years, this starts when I was a little kid and how listening to Yankee baseball on the radio as a child not only had me fall in love with sports, but the, the, the great announcers the Yankees had actually set my personality as a broadcaster, although I obviously didn't know it at the time. So I'm in the 1959. Now think about that. The day I walked into Yankee Stadium for the first time and the old Yankee Stadium, the Carters were really tight. And I'm walking in, and when I saw the infield for the first time, I can picture it like it's yesterday, it was like I fell in love. I fell in love with sports. It was one of the prettiest things I ever saw. And at that moment, you know, this is 1959. I knew I was going to do something with sports. It's crazy, but that thought was in my head, and it never changed. Now, when you're that young, you don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to do it or that kind of thing. And I quickly realized I wasn't good enough to play shortstop for the Yankees because I couldn't field, I couldn't hit, I couldn't run, I couldn't go to my left, I couldn't go to my right. So it just sort of happened. And when I graduated college, it was like, okay, I'm going to be a broadcaster. I mean, it it sounds simplistic, but it's very, very true. So when I was a little kid growing up, when there was nobody in the house, I wouldn't even tell anybody I would turn the sound down of the TV and I would watch a Yankee game and I would do the play-by-play. And if anybody walked in the house, I'd immediately shut up. And I did it for years and years. And and so my love of broadcasting and baseball and the Yankees started at a very tender age. And and all that's in the book. As a matter of fact, Dr. John Long thinks that the first series of chapters, he thinks it's the best part because it, it, it tells about the story about how I got to Lexington and all the crazy things that happened to me in my journey. I mean, I started doing Little League Baseball on an FM rock station in Farmington, New Mexico for 100 bucks a week. And they were desperate when they hired me, and I was desperate to get my first job. So that's kind of all in there. I fell in love with sports at an early, early age. It's just what I wanted to do. 
Okay. I, I was already aware that you grew up a Yankees fan. And at the end of this podcast, I'm going to have a New York Yankees trivia question for you. Okay. I'll probably, I'll probably miss it, but bring it on. You can't talk sports without a trivia question. Sure you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, as far as the book, what was the most important thing to you when you were writing it? I didn't write it. It was there. Here's what I did. We had all these sessions, and I don't know how many. A picture just came up today. You know how things come come up on Facebook, and I went to a UK football game two years ago on this day. It was a picture of me and Doc, and at the time, there were 33 sessions we had done. You know what? And I need to find out how many. He noticed the number, and he would show up at my house 7 to 7.30 in the morning and put his phone down, and we would just record. We, we would just record and go for it. And we kind of went from there. Then he transcribed it. And then the work really began with the research and the background stuff and, 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 and checking things out. And, and then that's how this thing happened. See, I, I, I was told I have a, if I have an older brother in the business, it's Dick Hoops Weiss. And he just finished his fourth book with Vitale, Dick Vitale. And he's got, I don't know, 17, 18 books out. And he's in Sports Writing Hall of Fame, and he's a dear friend. And I called him up, and I said, don't tell me how to succeed. Tell me how I don't, quote, fail miserably. And he said, hey, boy, if the book doesn't sound like you, you're going to fail miserably. And so one of the things that makes Stock and I feel really good about all the lovely things people have said about the book, we've been overwhelmed by the response of the people that have read it. And one of the things we've heard back so many times that people are telling us they can hear my voice when they read the book. So hopefully we accomplish what we set out to do because I was different. So I had to be me in the book, you know, me. Who, who came up with the idea for the book cover? It's an interesting book cover. The general's name is David Blondell. And you probably have seen some of his artwork. He has done all these retro poster is about former UK stars and it's fascinating his father was the was the pastor chaplain however you want to refer to the Kentucky basketball team for the entire time that Joe B Hall was the coach and so he got to know these guys and he's done all these posters well David and I are friends I called him up one day said let's go have a cup of coffee we're having a cup of coffee I told him do the book and I said I need someone to do the cover and he literally grabs my hand and says, I got it. Instantly. I go, okay, tell me. And he goes, oh, not telling you. I said, come on. And I'm trying to make him on. He says, if you keep on pushing me, the coffee is over. <laughs> and I'm sure he says, you know what? So we sat there because we're friends. And, we took, and he said, don't bring it up. So I tried a couple times and didn't. And we sat there, you know, just catching up and that kind of thing. And he said, look, this is going to take me a while. I'll call you when I'm done. Okay. So I don't hear from him. You know, I don't even remember how long. It's two or three months somewhere in there. And he calls me up and says, let's go have a cup of coffee. Okay. So we're sitting and talking. I'm going, are you going to show me? Because he was doing it on purpose to kind of stretch it out. And so this is 100% his idea, me chasing Billy Gillespie. Because whether I like it or not, that's what I'm known for so well. The other thing is, if you're looking at the cover, my wife deserves 1,000% of the credit for the name of the book. She needed to cut to the chase. Oh. So, you know, Judy gets all the credit for that, and David gets all the credit for the cover, and and I have no input and no credit for anything. <laughs> and, and, and that's kind of how this thing went. You know, I have a lot of help from really good people. And, and, and a cow likes to say it takes an army to do stuff, and, and really, everybody helped me. My wife helped me tremendously. Uh, Doc was unbelievable, Dr. John Long, Just unbelievable. Dick Coop twice, when I had some questions, he answered them and, and, and just said, just keep on being you and do what you're doing. And then, there was a lot of positive help, and, you know, like my wife wasn't afraid to say, yeah, I don't know if I, this is a good idea. You know, we would bounce stuff off each other, and her logic was just really, really helpful. So it was an army putting this together. So I take zero credit for the cover. How about the selection of the photographs in the book? That, that yep. was me, and that was a problem. And this will make perfect sense. I had way too many photographs, and they said, try to keep it to 20. 
and I think it's 24 or something like that. And really, I agonized getting to 30. And then I went from there, and then I showed a couple people a couple pictures, and we kind of, you know, we knocked it down from there. And there were, I could have put it in 50 or 60, easy. Uh, it was done by feel, which is basically how I did everything in life. <laughs> it was done by feel. I know preparation is very important to you during your career, getting prepared for a sporting event or a sports report. How did the advent of social media technology impact your preparation work, pre-internet and post-internet? Google. (laughs) You know, uh, everything's on Google, so that helped tremendously. I mean, I looked up, you know, for example, we mentioned the game that Melvin Turpin had over 40 points against uh, Tennessee, and I was there covering the game, and so... I remember he had over 40, but I don't remember where he shot. And so, you know, um, you looked up the game story, this kind of thing. I mean, you remember the basics, but there were certain things needed for filling in the blanks. I spent a, <laughs> countless hours on the computer. Matter of fact, Doc even said, and he put me preface, that I drove him crazy with me making sure that every little detail was right. And then in the end, Although I drove him crazy, he said it was worthwhile because you get one shot at this. I'm not doing another one of these. It's 460 pages. And I I was like this in TV. And this is now about my life. So, you know, I was crazy about trying to make sure everything was was absolutely correct. And, and there was stuff I checked and rechecked and those kinds of things. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but Google is a wonderful thing. How we did our jobs before Google, I have no idea. <laughs> Seriously, I, I, you know, I've often thought about what it was like to be reported in the 1940s and 50s, and it was basically, you know, what was in front of you. You know, yeah. Ruck was coaching the team, and, and you were a TV guy. Well, not TV guy in the 1940s, but if you were, you were a TV guy, you know, Dave Ruck's career or whatever, it's what he said. That's what you had. So it probably was much easier in certain ways because. And I've talked to some older reporters, you know, they had to rely upon their memory or some file, and they kept their stories that way. And I've read enough old old stories to realize that's kind of how it was. And so, you know, if you're not lazy, Google has amplified the fact that you can do all kinds of things and look up. And I know that storytelling is very important to you. Your philosophy as far as reporting sports is if I've done my research correctly, is you really enjoy the storytelling aspect of that. Did you bring that into your book, the storytelling joy? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I'm a storyteller. Absolutely. And and it's interesting. I never considered myself that when I got into business, but like anything else in life, you grow and you change. And uh, I, I actually give credit to the Kentucky Derby for really changing the emphasis of my career because, um, you know, LEX 18 still has a contract for the Derby because it's on NBC. And when we got the contract, all of a sudden we get a memo on how we're doing all this live stuff. And we all went, how in the world are we going to pull this off? And, and I have to tell you, our engineers and producers, the amount of work that they do just to set this up, it, it's literally amazing that a station our size has pulled off the Kentucky Derby with the lack of technical difficulties that we've done for years and years and years and years. So what happened was it just sort of evolved that I did more stories than anybody else for the Derby every year. And I was totally left alone. And these were very long stories. And I could tell the story. And so this really changed my career and changed me And instead of just banging out, you know, let's say what I would call a 90 second story, let's say Kentucky's playing Tennessee, that kind of thing. Now I'm looking into people's lives and their past and how they did it and those kinds of things and what's important. And and I would ask people about their moms and dads because I did that when I actually talked to football and basketball players to get different responses. And so I took what I was doing as a TV reporter and just amplified it because I had time. And I'm really proud of it. I'm very proud of it. Uh, and and, and one, one of the many comments that I've had is that, you know, there's a lot of names in here that people know, you know, rough this, that, and the other, but there's stuff about these people that you didn't see elsewhere. 
I mean, you know, how many people know that Ada Frook was going to coach Duke and where I got that story and how it happened and who gave me the story? It's all in the book and, and about people's feelings and how they change. And, and, and the stuff on the Rupp family isn't just about the Rupp themselves. It's about how Adolf Rupp affected the lives of his son and his grandson and the family and how they're affected to this day and how it was tough for them. I've got stuff that I saw personally, FBI letters written, letters that were written to, in the 1950s that had to be sent to the FBI that were sent to Rupp, um, the threat of kidnapped. All kinds of stuff, and, and this is storytelling. It's about people's lives. It, it's not about, you know, Rupp won X number of games, or Rupp did this, or Rupp did that. So, basically, the Derby changed my career. It allowed me to grow and amplify what I was already doing, and I really, really, really enjoyed it. It was a wonderful challenge. Can you talk a little bit about your radio work? I know that was, I think, your first love. I uh, absolutely ready was my first love. And I never thought about getting into TV. TV happened by accident. It was like, remember the, the old Beatles album, The Magical Mystery Tour? That's how my career was, starting in New Mexico and just kind of bouncing around and moving on and, and trying different things. My love was for baseball. And so my first job was doing Little League Baseball on an FM rock station in Farmington, New Mexico, two games a night, six days a week, and I got a walk in $100 a week, literally. <laughs> and I lived over a place called Snooker's Pool Hall, which was not very smart. It was really not a safe place to live. Shouldn't have lived there. I ended up moving to another side of town, but that's neither here nor there. And I loved it. I mean, I loved doing Little League Baseball in Farmington, New Mexico. Absolutely loved it. I, I, I loved doing the baseball play-by-play. I have a picture on my desk that my wife found, and there's a picture of me in a tank top, a headset on, calling a game in Grand Junction, Colorado, and it's my favorite individual picture of my entire career. Because in Grand Junction, it's, which is, by the way, one of the prettiest parts of America, uh, when you're doing the game, it was semi-pro baseball at the time, and a lot of guys who were on the field, ended up in the major leagues. One guy ended up in the Hall of Fame. Seriously, Paul Malter, but that's the end of there. But that was the happiest I ever was in bracket, in that spot, doing baseball play-by-play, -play in, in that particular place. I absolutely loved it. I never thought about going to TV. TV happened by accident, and I had a good time, so I kept on doing it. I mean, if I had to do it all over again, just career-wise, I probably would have stayed in the radio. I love radio. Absolutely love radio. And when I wasn't doing, I missed it. Uh, and I had a great time in TV, but I love radio. I think you did great work with the Bengals broadcast over the years. Thank you. Uh, now, coming from New York, how was the adjustment to Lexington, Kentucky? I know it's two di very different places. Well, it, it was easier because, come on, I lived in Farmington, New Mexico. I, I, if there was somebody, and I got to meet a lot of people because it sounds silly, but in Farmington, and I say this respect, Little League Baseball was a big deal now. And, and I was really surprised how big of a deal it was. It wasn't a big deal because of me. It was a big deal because it was big to the community. And so I never met anybody who was in Farmington that lived east of the Mississippi. I'm sure somebody was there. And I got to meet a lot of people in a short time period. And so, you know, when you live in places like Farmington and Boise, Idaho, and, you, and you're doing stuff like that in Grand Junction, Colorado, I was already adjusting. And I was young and loose and crazy, and it didn't bother me. I just, I was just me. It's probably a bad answer, but it's true. So there wasn't much adjusting to me. I was just going to be myself, and somebody accepted that fine. If not fine, I didn't care. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of been my attitude, you know, the whole time. Yeah. And, and what I found was, you know, when you're doing a little league baseball, people, people adapted to me right away because you're talking about their kids and you're saying nice things. You're doing a little league baseball, I'm not ripping anybody. I ripped the umpires a few times. But, I mean, generally speaking, you know, it's all positive. So people really like you. And, and I can't tell you how many people who said, you know, I didn't think I'd ever like a Yankee. Like some people would call me a Yankee, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, it wasn't difficult. That might sound silly, but it's the truth. Talking about baseball, and I know you grew up a Yankees fan in the late 50s and 60s. 
And I know you went to uh, Pittsburgh for, I think, three years during your career to work uh, at a radio and television station there. Katie and Hicks guess, was the top yeah. station radio for TV and radio in, in uh, Pittsburgh. It's a great, it's a great organization. I cannot resist this question. When you were in Pittsburgh, did you ever have the opportunity, being a Yankees fan, to interview Bill Mazeroski? I talked to Bill a couple of times. I don't think I talked to him for TV. Um, I talked to him a couple of times at like some old timer events, but I don't think I ever put him on TV. Yeah. I, I know he home. broke your all's heart in 1960 with oh, that home yeah. run. As a matter of fact, we listened to it on the radio. I, I didn't even see the home run that he hit with Yogi Berra playing left field. You thought I forgot that, right? I didn't see it till like the next day. But yeah, Ralph Terry, who gave up the home run, was into harness racing. Oh. And so I actually interviewed him in Lexington. He had some horses at, at the Red Mount, and we did a story one time. And I told him wow. I was in New York. He grew up a Yankee family starting in here. He says, all right. He did it with a smile. He said, just ask me the question, get it over with. Because any time he did an interview, he was asked about it. And so we did talk about it. But, we, you know, he was, he was from back to East. I think he was from New Jersey, if I remember. And a very nice man. And you well, know, he, just, he just threw a fastball at the wrong part of the plate. And Mazeroski crushed it. Well, he made up for it a couple years later by getting Willie McCovey to line out to Bobby Richardson to end the 1962 series. And actually, I remember that like it was yesterday when McCovey hit the ball. I thought it was a base hit, which would have changed everything. And and McCovey, years later, for years, said it's one of the hardest hit balls he ever had. And the Yankees was actually pure luck because he crushed that ball. Just crushed that ball. I, I grew up a Cincinnati Reds fan, but uh, anybody that grows up as a baseball fan in the 60s, the New York Yankees, and, of course, Mickey Mantle really catches your attention. And, by the way, one of the reasons we chose today is for your interview is today's Mickey Mantle's would have been his 89th birthday. And Mickey was my hero growing up, by the way. Mine, too, other than Darren Johnson for the Reds. Darren Johnson, that's interesting. It's interesting two people you have. As a matter of fact, um, it, it's in the book. Our son's name is Jordan, and I wanted to name him Mickey Merritt. And I made that suggestion to my wife, and that lasted about one second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, he, he, was, um, he was a great player. He, 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 oh, and, and you know what's sad is how good he could have been yes. if he didn't have the alcohol problem. And the other thing is, you know, he ripped his knee. The Yankee Stadium, they had one of the – I will never understand why they did this. It was so incredibly stupid. They had drains in the field for yes. letting water escape. And I don't know if you know this, he ripped his knee on one of those drains, and he was never the same. Yeah. 1951 World Series. He was like 19 years old at the time, right before he was a kid. Do you know you're Mickey Mantle? Oh, and, uh, yeah, you know, if this were today, he probably would have been fine because they'd have done surgery. And, and it was amazing how he played in pain his entire career and still hit all those home runs. And how many times he was hung over and played. Seriously, I mean, it's just you know, alcohol was a bigger problem in baseball than I think people realize. I think that near the end of his life, he really lamented the fact that he could have been as great as he was. He could have been even better with a little more discipline with any discipline. Um, well, you, you know, the story about his dad, Mutt, who oh, yeah. uh, succumbed to the disease in, in spending a life in the coal mines. And so he thought he wasn't going to live long. So he said, yeah, I'm just going to have a good time. And then he lived longer than he thought. And he started having the regrets. He admitted a long time before he finally told the public. Talking about Mickey man, I used to have a baseball car from, for, for, Mickey Mantle, I think 1963. And did you collect baseball cards? I did. And, okay. and I wish I kept them. Same here. Um, my my mom wanted me to throw them out. And when I went to college, whatever I left over, she got rid of. 
Yeah, if we kept our baseball cards, we'd be doing this interview in Las Vegas, I think. Um, could be, except, as you know, they have to be in mint condition. So what I used to do, we used to flip cards. And I was real good at that. I, many times I did 100 in a row. Did you flip cards as a kid? No, we just collected them and put them in stacks. We would flip cards. And so you would, you would literally... You would try to get as many, you know, heads or tails as you can, and you would, and you would pick up the pile that way. And I practiced at it, and I was really good at it. And and I can't tell you how many times I would get a hundred heads in a row. <laughs> Seriously. And, and so you would you would win cards that way. And I would never put my Mickey Mantle in in when you do it with other kids and stuff. And so the idea was to try to get two or three extra. First of all, you want to get one of your favorite players, and then when you had one. You would never gamble it, and then you would try to get a second or third of that, and then you would put aside the best copy of the of your favorite player stars, and never never then do it when flipping. We would do colors and flipping. I haven't thought about this in, in four. I don't know how long, but I, I got a lot of baseball cards. You know, you would buy those little tops things where they have a piece of bubble gum that's like five or six cards, something like that. And so they were new coming out, and you always wanted to play that game with somebody who was always buying new cards. And so uh, I always got, I got tons of extra cards flipping that way. That's a great story. Okay. Alan, you've had an outstanding career and I know you cover this in your book, but the one incident you will probably be most remembered by, and you mentioned it earlier, was the March 2009 chase after coach Billy Gillespie. Can you tell us a little bit about, that incident in your mindset in trying to get the interview? Well, you know, I didn't think what I did was that big of a deal. So there were media from all over. There was national media. I mean, media from Louisville showing up wasn't unusual. But like the Louisville media sent news people and sports people. And we had two cameras there. Uh, we weren't the only TV organization with two cameras there. And there was this huge flocking of media types and live trucks and cameras and reporters standing around outside Wildcat Lodge. And nobody knows what to do. And you don't know what's going on. And Gillespie comes out of Wildcat Lodge and he's got the phone in his ear. And we all said the same thing. He's not on the phone. And he gets in the car and just drives away. And at that point, I was guessing he wasn't coming back. Why would you come back when there's all these media people there? And he hated the media and was terrible with the media. And it, it's amazing how he didn't get better with the media. It, it's actually stupefying to me that he was as bad as he was starting out, and a year later, he was still that bad. Uh, it, 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 it was always incredulous to me. I mean, I, I remember the first press conference he had inside Memorial Coliseum, not the first press conference, but the first one inside Memorial Coliseum, and I'm sitting on the side and his hands are underneath the desk, and he's kind of wringing his hands. And I could see his knuckles, and they were white. He was that uncomfortable. And I'm going, this dude is not going to survive. I mean, it, it wasn't like there were a thousand people there. I don't know, there might have been 25 media types and three or four cameras, maybe five, you know, maybe six or seven cameras. It was just, it was a typical day. You know, it wasn't like the first press conference where the whole world is at. And I'm going, this isn't going to work. It's just not going to be. It's just not, it's not going to work. So after he takes off, we're standing there. We have no idea what to do. And I, we, I gathered our little group and I said, here's, here's the deal. I'm taking one of the cameras and I'm going to the back. And, and one of the people I work with said, you think he's going there? And I go, I have no idea. I said, if, if it's me, why would he even come back? Even if he left something in the office, he can have somebody get it later unless there's something he has to have. So we go to the back. And I was very surprised when we went to the other side of the Royal Coliseum. There were only a few people there. And I didn't think the crowd would be as big, but I thought it would be bigger than it was. And so we're standing there. And again, you know, <laughs> time is marching, and we got to put a story together, and all anybody has Besides knowing that he's gone and the release that UK put out and that kind of thing, you know, he's fired and a certain amount of point, you got to put the story together. And everybody has the same footage of him walking into his car and driving away. It's all the same. And we're standing there and standing there, and I don't know what to do. 
and nobody knew what to do. And I wasn't ready to quit on it because it was early enough in the afternoon. I probably would have stayed there another hour, maybe a little bit longer because I could have done the live shot from there. And then we could have had a camera there just trying to shoot. And then me doing the live shot and I could have ad lived around it, which is what I would have done, which I had to do many times. Well, he eventually shows up and I'm shocked. And so everybody tries to get a shot of him. And it weren't, like I said, not many people there. Well, then he goes inside, and a couple of people went with me, and then they just quit. And so all I did was basically doing what I always did. I went into the story. And to this day, I'm surprised the other people there quit. As a matter of fact, I did a podcast for John Lewis. I don't know if you know John. We did it about a week ago. He works for WDRB. He's a really good guy, good sports guy. He's been a friend for a long time. And he told me during a podcast, he said, we were all jealous of your footage. Interesting. Nobody ever told me that, that I competed with after all these years. And so, you know, the down the hall thing. I get back to the TV station, and I'm feeling pretty good. I got something nobody else has. And it was the greatest thing since life spread. I uh, thought it would help the story out. I walk into the station, and it's after 6.30. And, and I don't know what you know about newsrooms, but there's different shifts. And after the early news, boom, people leave as, as quickly as they can. There were more people there than normal because of all the live shots and that kind of stuff. And a couple people I walk in were cheering and, and standing and clapping. Great. And then a couple hours later, everything kind of fell apart. All the hate. Mail. We emails we got. It was unbelievable. All the hate emails we got, and so I regret to this day that they made me apologize for just doing my job. And I put the apology email that my boss had to look at before he approved it. And we had like a thousand emails. Try to think about that in a couple hours, and they were hateful and vengeful and mean and nasty. And I never thought any of these people were, were mad at me. They were embarrassed that Billy Gillespie embarrassed Kentucky basketball. And the funny part was the overwhelming majority of people that responded to my apology apologized to me, Mm -hmm. which was interesting. But TV management went nuts about it. I mean, they went crazy about it. It got really, really nasty. (laughs) There was a while I thought I was getting fired. You know, anybody that grows up here in Kentucky or anybody knows anything about sports knows the uh, Kentucky basketball coaching position is is about the highest profile job you can have in sports in the country, and you don't get paid to uh, dodge questions e- even after you get fired. <laughs> it's very apparent that Coach Gillespie didn't understand the public relations aspect of the job as well as maybe he should have. Well, there's two things here. One, he never should have been hired. So that was UK's fault. Seriously. The night the story was breaking, and everybody had the story, it's a freak out night. You're trying to do everything you can to get as much information you can. I call people I know, people I don't know. I talk to reporters in Texas. And in three hours, I found out enough information that I never would have hired. I put all that in the book. Never would have hired. Never. And, and I got him as a hot coach. You know, he played the game at Rupp Arena, NCAA game, and he, he had done a great job yeah. down in Texas. But there's a lot of really good coaches that you can't come to Kentucky. And, you, you know, I had, a, I had a guy who was covering the team tell me that there were only a few people covering the team back in Texas, and he wasn't comfortable with more than a few people around him and wasn't comfortable with that. And I remember asking this guy, well, how in the world is he going to survive here? And the person said, I don't know if he can. This is somebody who covered it. And when you get that information, it's kind of like, if I wouldn't have hired him after three hours, why did Kentucky hire him? I mean, Kentucky made an egregious mistake. Look, there are times, there's no question about this. You put people in place to succeed in life. And a lot of coaches who have, been, who have failed and who have been hired, it's really the fault of the people hiring them because they never should have been hired. That's not always the case now. Now, with Bill Curry, I'll be honest, and, and I put in the book about him failing. I, I like Bill as a person. I have a tremendous respect for him. I like him tremendously, actually. But he was a failure at Kentucky. And, and I'll tell you straight out, I thought he was a great hire, and I was wrong. I, I, and I, to this day, I'd hire him again. 
And I have all these theories as to what went wrong, and I put it in the book, and you don't want to go into that now, and I, and I get that. And so that one I could see. But there have been some hires where people failed, and you're going, what are you doing? <laughs> really? What are you, like, do you feel the pressure to hire somebody or can you not see what's going on? So hiring Billy Gillespie was just dumb. Yeah, I've always thought, you know, speaking of Bill Curry, he replaced Jerry Claiborne. And I've always thought Claiborne was a great coach, but Kentucky got him near the end of his career. And they should have hired Howard Schnellenberger. And I put that in. And and that had to do with the relationship between him and Cliff Hayden. I walked in on a meeting, a private meeting. It's in the book. And I don't want to go too too details crazy for you. But they were at, at the Lexington Country Club, and I walk into a meeting where Howard was on the job if you walk right up to the table. I said, hi, Howard. I <laughs> Chris Hayden was sitting there. Ralph Gabbard, the general manager, president of Channel 27, was there. Uh, I believe Ralph Hackard was there. <laughs> I asked him point blank, he going to be the Kentucky coach. <laughs> and he should have been, and, and, and Jerry did a great job. He, so, he, you know, and, and I know, and I've said this, and it's angry some of Jerry's players who love Jerry. And, and I respect that tremendously. But Howard Schnellenberger should have been the coach. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind he should have been the coach. Yeah. But it was personalities. What's <laughs> best for Kentucky? Not what's best to fit your personality. If, if we could have got Jerry Claiborne in the late 60s, uh, it, I think he would have done wonders for the program. But I think he went to Maryland instead. But speaking of Schnellenberger, I think he realized what he had in his Miami of Florida football team, what was uh, – beginning to happen with that program. And uh, I think he knew he he was on the cusp of a national championship contender and probably would have been reluctant to come to Lexington. Uh, He wanted the job. You know, he's the one that changed Miami. I'm convinced that he stayed there. He might have won four, five, six national championships and never looked at Howard differently. And, and you know, Howard and I have talked about this. Howard's been really good to me. And, and he'll never say it, but he's kind of said it with a twinkle in his eye. So his last breath, it will bother him. I believe that he wasn't a Kentucky coach. And he applied more than once. But his personality turned off some people where I would say, I don't care about your personality. Can you win? If you're the best person for the job, you're the best person for the job, period. And, and, and my mother taught me that lesson from stuff we're not going to get into it, but the stuff that I saw her going through, not getting some jobs that she should have gotten, that was overqualified. They went to some men because they were men, and she was so much more qualified. And as a child, this stuff bothered me. Well, Schnellenberger ended up basically turning the Louisville program around. I covered his first game, by the way. It's in the book. Before, uh, Alan, before we get to our New York Yankee trivia question, just okay. one more question for you. You retired in 2018, but I know you plan on doing some radio work with the high school team. And what are your plans? Actually, I've been radio for a year. I called Madison Central, mostly in some Madison Southern games. You know, it's interesting. It's going to get quiet after the rush of the book happens, and it's already starting to slow down a little bit. I want to do something that's fun, and I don't know what that is. And if it's not fun, I'm not doing anything. You know, what happened with the virus and the awful things going on, one of the things we had planned for the book is that, you know, rotary clubs and stuff like that, they always need speakers. And so the plan was that I was going to do as many rotary club speeches across the state of Kentucky. And I'm sure it would be easy to get many of them because they're always looking for speakers and put together a funny 20, 25 minute speech, which would be easy to do. And not only sell books. Because I'm told that's one of the great ways to sell books. You bring books with you. Some people buy them and you sign them, you know, that kind of thing. But I was doing some motivational speaking a long time ago, and I'd like to get back into speaking for companies. And when you go to, let's say, World Club meetings, there's a lot of community leaders in there. And I think that would have rekindled my speaking career. Well, that's out the window, too. And, and so that was sort of a, a plan that will happen now. And it'll be interesting to see if next year at this time the Rotary Club is back. I hope not for my sake, but for the country's sake, that people are gathering again, obviously. So that was the thought because that was fun. And I wanted to do a little traveling, maybe doing, you know, 10, 15 speeches a year. 
Uh, I thought about doing a radio sports talk show, and I've turned down some some companies, but haven't found out, haven't found something that I would want to do. You know, like, for example, it uh, doesn't matter if the station said, hey, how about doing sports talk at night? There's no way. So I want my cake and eat it, too. You know, especially since in Lexington, Cincinnati, and in Pittsburgh, I had shows that were number one. <laughs> and I don't know, I'm sure somebody else has done it, but there can't be very many people that have had two different markets where they've been number one in their time slot. And so I really like radio. I'd like to do it. I'm not sure it's ever going to happen. I don't know. No, no, I'm not going to worry about it. Well, you've, you've had a great career. Yeah, we wish you well. I have no doubt if you choose any, any other things to do, you'll be quite a success. Now, I can't end this podcast without asking a sports trivia question. I'm probably going to miss it, but bring it on. Well, it's a New York Yankees. And so what? I mean, I, I, mean, I remember stuff from well, the group. That doesn't mean I'm going to get this right. <laughs> well, let's try and we'll see. August 20th, 1964. The Yankees had just been swept by the Chicago White Sox. I'm sure I'm Chicago, remember this. Okay. In, in Chicago and were headed to the airport on the team bus. They've fallen four and a half games behind the White Sox in the pennant race. You're going to talk and, about a harmonica? Okay, you got it. Yes, yes. I was going to ask what <laughs> was what was the musical instrument involved between Yogi yeah. Berra. And the shortstop's name was Phil Lentz. Phil Lentz. Who had, who had really thick glasses and couldn't see really well. And yeah. when he got sweat in his eyes and stuff like that, he had trouble seeing on the field. But go ahead. I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, that, that's the answer, the harmonica. Incident. But Yogi Bear was in the front of the bus, heard Lentz playing the harmonica, told him to pipe down, and Lentz didn't hear him. And he turned to Mickey Mantle and asked Mickey, what did he say? And Mickey said, he said, play it louder. And Bear came back to the back of the bus and they had a big argument. And, and that was really the impetus for them winning a pennant that year, or at least the legend goes. So, yeah, it was a great harmonica incident of 1964 and do you recall the tune he was playing that i don't remember M mary had a little lamb oh you're kidding yeah no i, he, didn't, I didn't i did not remember that's pretty funny well i'm i'm looking forward to to reading this book cut to the chase it's going to be coming out at least this week at local bookstores well and, okay a couple things it's on amazon now it's been on amazon. okay okay so all you got to do is you put Cut to the Chase. They sold out of books, so it's on Amazon now, and I hope there's some. I'm going to get a copy, and if I ever see you here in the Lexington Public Library, I'm going to chase you down to get an autograph copy. It sounds good. And which, which, which branch do you work at? I, I'm here at the Central Library. Well, I'll tell you what. When, when, you, when you get the book, you know how to get in contact with me. I'll come down just to sign it. Currently, we're not open because of COVID, but I'll, right. I'll give you I'll give you a holler. We'll sit, let's put it this way. We'll figure it out. I'd be, I'd be oh. honored to sign it for you. And, I, and by the way, thank you for inviting me, and I've enjoyed the time. Well, we enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Alan Cutler. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm. Or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.